<laughs> Yay! We're trying again. I love this. We always get like a second chance at like introductions this way. It is fantastic. And I wasn't I wasn't creepy this time, so it's good. And apparently my school's internet allows it. Yay! So I mean I love the double tasking with your job. I'm so impressed that you have um you have one thing that I can't even pronounce and endometriosis and everything else, and you're a school counselor and you run rare. I mean Oh, I mean, I, I, I mean, I have to admit, rare has become just like therapy. I really think um, that all of us who start businesses around chronic illness, it's like, this is not like the Silicon Valley killing it. This is like, I am so bored and lonely. Can I please like make something good out of this? Like anything to connect with other humans? Exactly. When people, sorry, my contacts, I just hit. But no, when people are like, oh, you're, you're such a, a boss. I'm like, no, no, no. Like if you seriously saw it, there's no boss <laughs> babe in this. Oh my God, the I babe. word. You're so inspiring. <laughs> Oh. That's like my least I'm favorite like, word ever. <laughs> I hate that. I'm like, I don't. I, I'm just trying to get on a yacht right now because, like you said, something good has to happen. Yeah, it's just I need some some sort. And it's like that weird, like um, I don't even know where you are right now, but like it just there's always this narrative around getting sick and having everything taken away, where it's like there has to be a reason and then it has to be something you build from that. And I like, I want to get as far away from the idea as possible because there's no shade and nothing wrong with like having a nervous breakdown over like whatever's going on in your life. This is my way of coping. Um, and I don't like to think of it as like a origin story kind of thing, but it's like, this is my coping skills and my coping mechanism. Exactly. Cause there's only so much on Netflix. Like I can't, <laughs> That, there's only so many times you can like literally rewatch all of the episodes. Except Mrs. Maisel. I will argue that there is no no end to the amount of times you can rewatch Mrs. Maisel. I have not watched that. Um, my wife actually she like loves um like Top Chef Top Model project on which ah! I swear to you they are like on a loop in our house it is not okay I, your wife and my daughter need to hang because I have seen project runways and I am uh, like you can see like this is my uniform is the sweatshirt I even put on makeup and brush my hair for you only otherwise this would have been a top knot and um yes oh I mean like my hair's currently I think up here it's so cute um yeah my daughter is super into those shows and then we are drag race fans we watch <gasps> drag race oh my gosh <laughs> we we could have an entire hour long uh, talk I mean, drag race. hey we could totally do that um Kiros my other co-host he even got me Bianca Del Rio's signature so <laughs> oh like... we have it too that's my favorite <laughs> that's um my wife's favorite queen and so um We've like gone to see her several times. Uh, we saw her in New Orleans. Oh, you're killing me! We met, <laughs> we, met we met her twice. So I mean, we are huge drag race fans. Um, Danji oh. is our new favorite. Like we're going to meet Banji. her. Danji. <laughs> <laughs> like who does this? But Nina West. Um, she was really inspiring, and I think she went too early. But <laughs> I have not seen this season yet. Um, oh. I feel really bad about that because I know, like, my fellow zebra was on there. So I'm like, oh, I yeah, so. um, yeah. That was also like, um, that was really inspiring too to see. And I don't know if it's like the car thing where it's like now that I'm sick, I feel like I like see so much of these people who are like have rare diseases or something. And, or if it's like a phenomenon or what's going on. I mean, one of my things is like, if I was this oblivious to how much pain people were in, like, I feel horrible. I feel like I should just write sorry notes over and over and over and over again. Cause like I was either just so oblivious or like it's happening more or like, I just, I, sometimes I feel so guilty actually, because I, I can, there's so many people suffering and I honestly had no like no idea. Like there's a whole spoonie community and zebras and like this exhaustion is something you can never, you can't even put into words. Like I, and people older than me, younger than me. Oh, I just, it's, it's been eye opening. You're, you're, you're touching on something. It's so important. I hate going away from drag race because believe me, I was hot I know. all day about drag race, um, but you brought up something that's so important. It's something that I've talked a lot about, which is that there's sick world and it's kind of like an Alice in Wonderland experience that you're kind of walking along in healthy world. 
and there's this other parallel universe, like, I'm going to show what a geek I am, Neil Gaiman's Neverwhere, where, like, you suddenly, like, drop into London Below, and it's like, oh my god, this has existed alongside, right in the peripheral yeah. vision, forever. Yeah, like, exactly, it's... like, and I just, I, oh, you, that is a great way to explain it, because that's exactly how I feel, I feel like I'm walking around my normal life, except for I'm not, like, nothing is normal anymore, like, Oh my but god! But everything feels, and everything feels like if you were to look at it, it feels the same. And I feel like I'm just watching this movie, and I can see it all happening. But it's just like I'm just a shell of the. I just I don't know. But yeah, that was the best way to describe it. And it's I just like I feel so your bad. Own life. I mean, it's like being a ghost in your own life. Like, like you said, yeah. like you're walking along, uh, you're living your own life, but it's someone else in the shell, and the shell is not working. <laughs> And it's like nothing I liked, I and I'm trying to like like my job that I was once so in love with. Like I'm trying to be this person. Like it's like I'm faking it, but I'm not even faking ill or this. I'm literally just trying to fake. Well, I guess I'm trying to fake well enough to be who I used to be. But nothing about this girl that I used to be. Like I know her. I love when people tell stories about her. She seems phenomenal. <laughs> it's not me. <laughs> It's kind of like what, okay, so RuPaul freak out, um, I read his first book, and he's saying that we are, like, he goes Joseph Campbell all the time, but he was saying, like, we are celestial beings in drag, that our human bodies are the drag, and you know, there's, like, yes. a parallel there to, like, now this sick person is in a body that everyone recognizes, and if it's an invisible illness, nothing else looks different, but the person inside has changed dramatically. And I don't even know when it happened. Like, I can't even say, like, you know, New Testament, Old Testament, like, big things happened. Like, right? But, but here I am just feeling like, I mean, this year I feel like I've noticed it so much. I think I wrote about this in my first blog post. It's like, sometimes I wish I would have stayed in the catatonic state of just not knowing how bad it was. Because, like, now it's like I'm well enough to realize how much I lost well enough to realize how much you can't do and but not well enough to do or even be this new person because it's just like I'm not healthy enough yet but I'm not missing you know 336 hours of work a week <laughs> so you know it's just it, it, it's been the most I don't even know experience and like I said and you know yeah the rare is some good from it but really it's just my way of trying to find my way back to life, like back yeah. to the living. <laughs> I mean, we grab on to like what we can remember look like. So then we can just start like kind of grasping at little parts of it again. But exactly. You came to this later. I mean, you came to this at what, 28 when you started to get sick. So you'd already, yeah. you'd already educate yourself for a certain career. You'd already started a certain career. And like that blows my mind. I've been sick since I was eight. So I really planned my life oh, wow. around like, Okay, so I need to plan for, you know, I go to school to be an English teacher. That didn't work out. I Like, I was able to plan things around my illness, mm -hmm. knowing that it was going to get worse. Um, not knowing what it was, just knowing it kept getting worse. Yeah. So, like, for you, what ha like, you had my dream job, by the way. Like, school counselor was, like, my thing. Like, I just wanted oh. to be so badly. So, uh, tell me about, like, how this all worked out. You you went to school. Everything seemed okay. And so, I mean, I, I can't tell you that I... Um, never even got strep throat really like I wanted to be sick when I was younger because I wanted to stay home I never <laughs> really it. had yeah like I never had a fever like my mom was like I was always like kind of abnormally healthy never broke a bone like not, not nothing of that nature and so went about my life um went to college uh what was pre-med went against my parents wishes you know became a social worker then you know went to grad school and you know, <laughs> I'm sorry, but how did uh, I want to help people go against your parents' wishes? That's tripping me up a little bit. My, my parents wanted me to be a doctor <laughs> so bad. And like, I just had a thing for science. And like, that's the other thing too, is like, I had a memory, like a very scary memory. Like it was just so good. Like I could be like, I, I mean, I scored a hundred on my high clinic. So you have to have one license to practice social work and you have to have another license to have like a private practice and stuff. And so like when I was getting my higher license, I got a hundred on it because I could literally, as long as I wrote things out, it's like I could remember. I could remember where I 
like I could visualize every word and writing it and stuff. It was just the weirdest thing. That that is long gone, by the way. <laughs> I, can't, I can't remember what I'm wearing and I'm wearing it and I'm looking at it. So you I'm haven't just, quite you know, hit that, that, that until you're walking around trying to find your glasses that you're wearing. <laughs> I, most of the time, I can't even tell if like I'm like, are my contacts in? Like, because everything's all really blurry. <laughs> yeah, it's like you know, I just I mean, I. I I was dating men. <laughs> I mean, like, cause so I something's changed. <laughs> yeah. Like, well, like I said, I mean, I, I never thought like, it's never like, even like I would be like, Oh, I had these feelings. No, I really enjoyed my men life and my friends. I had, you know, great friends and, um, friends since high school, friends since elementary school. So the fact that they're like, this is even a thing, I guess that they're, you know, didn't say by like, you know, people, it's so funny because people just do, they get, they think you're lying or they think, you know, they get tired of it. I mean, my friends have been my friends since third grade. Like those have been my core people, but anyway, so, um, grad school, finished grad school, like said, one license, the other license, um, worked for child family services, moved down to DC with my ex actually. He was going to law school. I worked at Child Family Services. Um, everything fine, fine. Um, went to a law firm, worked at a law firm for a little bit, and then ended up in, a, in schools. I completely found, like, found my niche with social work. Um, I liked the other disciplines of social work, but um, there was just there, something about the fast pace of high school kids. It was like, I called it forever high school. It was wonderful. Like, I loved it. Um, that did that for two and a half years. Then I became the director of like three different schools. Great. Everything is like, still like, I said, this is like, I, I'm progressed. I, you know, life is going the way, the trajectory. Um, my ex and I broke up my best friend down here. Who's now my wife. Um, we always had a very special connection. Like, I can't tell you, I really did. I know people say like, it's biological. It's not, it wasn't biological for me. Like it was literally just, an active choice. And I don't know if it was some divine intervention. Cause I don't know if anybody else could have gone through the last two years with me. Like, so it, um, but so we fell in love. And so this was in 2016. And then my job wanted me to do some things that I just wasn't like really okay with. They wanted in terms of how they were going to handle caseloads and stuff. And so it was time for me to leave. So that was heartbreaking for me. Um, so then from there, I got a job here. I went to the public sector um, and I, in public school, and I went down to elementary school. Very different. Very much slower pace, and I was devastated. Like, I really, I, I just, I didn't, I used to hate the weekends because I wanted to go back to work so bad. Um, so this was now summer of 2016. I'm also running marathons. I start to feel like my knee randomly when I'm not when I'm running, when I'm off on the couch starts to really kill me just randomly. And I thought it was from the running. I mean, I'm putting in miles every day training for a marathon. Um, so that's the first symptom I can really recall being a symptom. And so I'm 28, 2016 and I got some knee pain and I'm not loving my job. But it, I still have, a, like, honestly, I, I got a very sub substantial, like, raise. Like, I make a very good, like, you know what I mean? Like, everything in your vision of life, right? Minus the girl thing. I knew I had, like, my Catholic Republican family might have a little bit of a hard time with this. But, like, I, I can handle them. Like, overall, like, we're a strong enough family to handle. Like, I knew that that'd be fine. And so, um, although... That's like, that's like my turning point, August of 2016. And from there, it kind of just... I hate to say it, but 2016 was a turning point for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> we're all still shivering. Right? We're, we're all not the same. Um, so we, so in 2016, um, I start to get like more and more tired, but I do believe it's because, um, one, I'm a little bit, of maybe a touch of depressive situational, like, I'm, cause I want to be clinically yeah. correct here. Um, um, I don't want, um, uh, a lot of people classified it as depression at this time. However, um, it always felt different. It, um, 
always felt just like I had just done so much in the day. And even if I just went from the top of the stairs to the bottom, like it, it was different. And, and now I know it as like the exhaustion of this, like chronic illnesses, but, um, I knew that it wasn't depression. I just like, so whatever everyone could say, like they could say what they want. Yes. I had major transitional things going on, but, um, I was just getting more and more tired and I was not a tired person. I was more of the on the go, like I said, on the fly, you know, (laughs) case racing, you know, still like, you know, living my prime of my twenties. Um, so it was very, very slow too. So then March of 2017, now mind you, the the pain has kind of jumped from different areas. Like at some points I can't lift my arm. And I just thought, because this is what everyone's telling me around me is like, well, I just, in my head was like, okay, well, I must just be getting older. Like (laughs) that kind of stinks. Um, But I didn't really say much because who knows what to say, like about what symptoms are mattered. So you know, everyone was telling me I'm sleeping more and I'm this and I'm that. And my mom's telling me I'm depressed because, you know, I'm with a girl and. <laughs> oh, that seems like, um, yeah, that sure is so, part of the diagnostics. <laughs> right, right. Like, um, and, you know, Carrie, my wife is just like, you know, thinking that it's the job and then just being like, oh, you don't want to play anymore. I'm like, hey, what the heck? Like, everyone's going crazy around me. <laughs> so, um, you know. I had a lot of anger actually from the two of them. I'm very close with my mother and obviously Carrie. And I, I have a lot, I had a, to really work through the fact that I, I felt like they should have known, mm. like they should have known something was like seriously off with me. Um, because I, I mean, even I think at times now it's hard for me to accept that I am sick because for so long it was just put off as like something I had done to myself. Like, you know, as in, you know, like it was situational or it was because it was like whatever. Um, anyway, in March I was staying at my parents and I got up off the couch. My knees were really hurting again and my knee completely bowed both that I fell on the ground. My mom though now takes me and my mom's like that. It is not normal that you fall. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, my knee just does that. Like, and she's like, knees just don't do that at 28. And she's like, you need to go to your primary care demand a line test. Um, we have a house in Jersey and so there's like a lot of ticks there. And so my mom was just like, maybe you got bit when we were all painting the fence. They had just moved in, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, you need to go as soon as you get home. Like it is not normal. You just don't fall off. And then like, you know, for her, it's, she's like, maybe that's why you're so tired. And so like, this is the first time that anyone's really bringing up the idea of being sick to me. Um, mind you, I don't even think I, the, my, understanding of lupus mind you was do you, there was a top model episode where mercedes has lupus and mind you i was not i was like you're on top model you should who who cares what you have like just not understanding like what that even means to be exhausted like that to have you know those ailments but that mind you that's my entire extent so i don't even know this is serious don't even have a clue that this is anything that could be serious at all. So she thought you had Lyme's disease from the tick? Yeah, she thought that I maybe got bitten by a tick. Okay. Like, cause that, that was her association with joint pain and tiredness and, like, what that was. And I was like, so I went to my primary care. Um, you know, I told them about the, the joint pain, and I told them about this. Like, I was like, I'm, but I'm exhausted. I was like, I don't care about the joint pain. I'll get over that. I was like... But this, the, I, something's going on, like, where I'm so tired all the time. And I was told that I'm a social worker and I'm a therapist and I, and I have such great coping skills that um, I'm able to manage my, my own anxiety so much that now it's somatized, basically. And mind you, I'm sitting there like, that's not really how somatization works, but you're a doctor and I... <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean oh. to laugh, but like we always seem <laughs> to like fine, yeah. we just start like, wow, you have the white coat and the stethoscope. I believe you. Like, I, I, I mean, like, trust me. Now I'm like, I, I, yeah, I, I hear you. I, 
I have this but like, yeah. thing with that where it's like, oh, I, I, that, that doesn't sound right. That's not my experience in my entire life being in my body. But you went to medical school. You should know. <laughs> like, yeah, I have this weird like, belief when they tell me something, even if it goes counterintuitive to everything I know about myself. Right? And it's like, it's like giving them so much power. Yeah. So, and... And I, I still don't understand this because I feel that I had, he's like, well, what else is going on? Now, mind you, I have no idea about these autoimmune things or rare things. Like, but I'm just like, in my opinion, this normal girl who's just like got some real tired issues. Can you fix me? Give me some vitamin D. Let's, let's, let's go. So I don't say that I get canker sores so bad in my mouth because that's not relevant. I don't tell him that. Like, my hair is starting. Like, I don't tell him anything except for my main complaint. I'm really tired all the time. You don't, I didn't feel like I was asked many questions. I don't feel like anyone, and how would I know? How do I know that all these random things are connected? Like, I did that, go to medical school. So, like, I don't know. Like, if someone came in here and was, you know, I was told they were pres- presenting with X, like I would have a series of, you know, questions like, to ask them follow up and, and no one, and to this day, I feel like they're like, tell me your symptoms. And I'm sitting there like, where do you want me to start with that? Like, <laughs> I, I, I still don't want to answer that. I get <laughs> very upset about it. Like, cause I, what is everything like? Everything now seems important. At the time, nothing seemed important. So I'm still at this point of just not, I don't know what you want me to say. And I don't know what the clue that's going to give it to you. Can you help me get it out of me here? Because what is the clue? I, I don't know. I did, are my headaches related? Who knows? Like, you know, I have blurred vision, a lot of light sensitivity, but the, <laughs> I don't, these, none of these seem, you know, strep throat, you, you get like, I, you have a series of things or this, you have a series of things. Like I didn't know that any of this. So. And also if you go in with like a billion things, it's really easy to get written off as a hypochondriac. Like. It's... And I didn't feel like I had a billion things. I felt like anything that was like manageable enough. The only thing that was not manageable enough Ooh, yeah. since my mom already made me go was, I was like, Oh, might as well drop this tiredness thing. Like, <laughs> But, like, everything at that point was manageable enough. Like, not, I wasn't, like, I wasn't sick from when I was young. Like, you know, like, so to me, everything was okay. Like, yeah, the canker sores, they, they stuck in my mouth. But, like, they eventually would go away. Like, how would I know that, like, that was a clue? I don't know. You gotta tell me, what were the canker sores a clue for? I, I'm so curious now. That was the clue that gave, got me a rheumatologist. Um, what, what did that signify? I have no idea. Oh my gosh. <laughs> like, yeah. so all of my tests come up negative. Like, so mm. nothing comes up negative. Everything comes up negative. Okay, now, bless my mother's soul. question because you did. Yeah. I, most, uh, not most, I'm um, like, at least for me, like going, I've been sick. So I've had like a billion sit downs of nothing's wrong on your tests. So I get to a point where I expect it. How did you feel when you're sitting here sick and trying to like, this is your first time of diagnosis. The first time. Cool. Nothing's wrong with me. Let's, let's, wow. Can you just tell me how I'm going to fix this tiredness thing? Because like, I'm telling you, you gave me that and, and medication for anxiety and like it's, my joint pain's the same and my anxiety is the same. Not my anxiety. My, my tiredness is the same. So can we just readdress that tiredness thing I came in here about? Like, I just thought it was kind of good news. Like nothing's wrong with me. Like I've, I've obviously come to, <laughs> feel much differently um bless my mother's soul though she was the one that was like no you know um if like go back and 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 my mother-in-law is the doctor and so she was like you know what I want when you have a, a swollen joint when you have a I want you to take a picture of it and I want you to bring it to your doctor yeah, that's like, one of the best tips ever, by the way. Anyone who's listening to this, any of your symptoms that show up visually, take a picture with your, your camera phone, create a, in your um, photo albums, create a, a little photo album of it. So when you go to the ER or to a doctor's point, you can just click there. I mean, like, that's how I got my, my mast cell diagnosed was 
no one believed me until I showed them a picture of my entire face looking like something, like some sort of Klingon. Like I was total Star Trek. (laughs) No, and that was honestly, I, I, from the bottom of my heart, believe that she was such a catalyst in getting from like a seven year diagnosis that some people like for me only only a year. 30 years. (laughs) Yeah. Like, um, I, because that small little tip of taking pictures made a very, very big difference. So like when I get finger stars, I would take pictures when I got these weird rashes up. I did, uh, that was the one I got a weird rash shortly after, um, the falling thing that, and that's what had me, my mom pushing me kind of to go to like back to the doctor. And, so we did another round of the test, and like I said, and like it wasn't until I randomly had a canker sore, and he was like, "Well, what other, you know?" And I'm like, "What other symptoms? Like I don't have, like I, I just told you, like I'm really tired, like my joints, I got a little rash thing, like." Um, and so then once I had a canker sore, so I was like, I didn't, I literally just didn't know what he wanted me to say. So I was like, "I have a canker sore in my mouth, like." Mind you, I thought like canker sores came from, like, biting my nail, like, dirty. Like, so I'm thinking seriously, like, and uh, so from that point on, my that's, like, when my primary kind of really changed gears to thinking, like, something might be wrong. Now I sometimes go in there and I feel like he thinks he's going to, like, win some, like, like, I'm some, like, weird spectacle that he's going to, like, he, like, treats me, like, so good. But it's, like, also, he's, like, I read this study once that I'm just, like, oh, my God, dude. Like, <laughs> um, so, yeah, like, that. And then from there, I went to the rheumatologist. I mean, I'm allergic to sofa, so that's really, really challenging. Because when they don't know what's wrong with you, a lot of times they just give you um, Preclonal and Preclonal. And Preclonel has sulfa in it. And so, mind you, she did give me Preclonel, this first rheumatologist. Because uh, she, mind you, after telling me, nothing was really wrong with me, nothing's wrong with you, but I'll give you Preclonel. That's another concept I kind of didn't understand for a very long time. You were all telling me nothing is wrong, that you're making me feel like I'm crazy as I continue to get like much sicker. And but you're willing to give me these medications. Like, so I don't, am I fit or am I not fit? Because you're telling me this is like this heavy duty drug, like how to take it. You're giving this whole tutorial, right? But on the other hand, being like, but dude, nothing's really wrong with you. So I'm like, I really, I'm so confused at this point. I don't, and all I know is that I'm getting sicker. Like I'm consistent, like the exhaustion is getting worse. The rashes are coming more. Um, my, my joints are swelling. I'm a, I would go from being, I think, 130 pounds to 166. Like, I'm retaining water. Like, um, and so, yeah, like, then uh, my doctor who thinks that, you know, I'm a medical mystery or something, tells me, to keep, get, get, I get a tilt table test. Mind you, this oh, is after. those are fun. Mo- the most bar- barbaric thing I've ever done ever. really they should stop looking at old torture films and deciding that those are diagnostic <laughs> right like let me hang you upside down and see how long it takes you to faint oh, and if you don't faint you pass and if you like um, mind you so i get there and, the, and it's in cardiac wing and so that and i'm like going to good hospitals like i i'm in, i'm in dc like I, i'm not going to i'm going to georgetown george washington these are like these are not small little hospitals, you know? And the cardiologist was like, why are you here? Like nothing on your chart. Like, why are you in cardio right now? And I was like, dude, like, I don't have a clue why I'm here. I'm like, like, like that's a bad question to ask. Cause I, right now I'm feeling pretty defeated and uh, like not knowing what's going on. My, my first rheumatologist kind of poisoned me, <laughs> you know, gave, she told me that sulfa mites were different than sulfa. And I, so I took them, and uh, but I'll go back to the cardiologist. But anyway, so tilt table test came up positive. So then I went back to my primary with the p- positive, and he was just like, okay, well, I think you should go to an auto dysnomia doctor. I think that might be it. So I'm like, what, what, what are you talking about, sir? Like, I'm just, I'm so frustrated. Um, 
And that's, I think, the theme is just, like, I kept getting more isolated, more frustrated, and I didn't want to go to any more doctors because no one was telling me anything, and I didn't feel like I was being listened to. So what was the point of going and feeling so awful when I left? And that can be the hard thing for people around is to understand doctor fatigue. Or it's Mm -hmm. like, I mean, I know people around me get frustrated with me when I was like, you know, I can't see another doctor. And it's like, but they could help you. This next one could be the answer. And it's like, I'm not a gambling person. Like, I don't have any interest in gambling. And I'm perfectly fine leaving the slot table or the slots or the, the poker table. Like, I have to step back because it's depressing, sad, and takes my time. And I'm exhausted. And I need to just step away for six months. And that's actually like what I'm literally just coming out of. And that was, I mean, it was so hard for my family. I I don't to understand that what, like that I'm done. Like yeah. I'm not, not, I'm not, not fighting, but I'm, I'm done searching for an answer that is clearly not fair. Like mm. they don't know. So it doesn't matter how many times we tell this story, right? It doesn't matter how many times you take my blood the bottom line is that there's some protein that is attacking my body or multiplying my body and they don't know which one it is. And until they know what protein it is, and, and then maybe we can start to talk, um, you know? And so they diagnosed you with, I'm guessing, POTS? No. So, I mean, unless you're, I don't. I've never heard the term POTS. Oh, no. serial orthostatic tachycardic syndrome. It's where you're... Nope, not... No. I have not gotten... No, oh, no. I'm surprised. Okay, yes. <laughs> no, yeah. So, um, anyway, so I end up going to... I'm to a smaller... Uh, I So, my breaking point is I go to John Hopkins. I wait six months to get into John Hopkins. Wow, that's that's some serious, like, sick person credentials there. Like, <laughs> Yeah, like, I, you know, I get in, I whatever, I get into the pathology department, and... I sit with apparently, you know, in ranking the third best of a country, according to who knows what chart, some chart. Anyway, so, and I sit down and tell this whole story and she's just like, and it's funny because at the time she said, you don't have the storage you don't have like all these things. You don't have Sarah negative lupus. You have, because that's a long time they thought maybe I, I had that because that's why it wasn't coming up, but I had all this other sign. She's like, you have undifferentiated connective tissue disease. Now, mind you, at the time... Okay, wait, I need to I, understand. Is that like Ehlers Danlos or what is... Und- <laughs> well, and at the, so at the time, it was considered an unnamed disease. And at the time, it felt for me that she was stripping me of any bit of like label or a group or anything like it very much so felt um like she shattered my entire world so I'm like crying and you know she's telling me I need therapy so now I'm just thinking you're calling me crazy and like so I'm like I'm shut off I can't even look at you like because I don't hear you her her she wanted me to go to an allergist that I had to wait six months for to try to get it so that I would not be allergic to sulfa so I could take Prequinel because it was an umbrella medicine. So basically undifferentiated connective tissue diseases, they have no clue what protein is attacking your body. How my rheumatologist explained it was that rheumatitis or lupus, their IG, let's say something, is what they know to be associated with. And they don't know what protein is associated with this set of symptoms. And so um, it was originally um, an, uh, considered an unnamed disease and it was accepted into the rare disease just only a few months ago. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's basically nothing. And that's what it is. <laughs> it's a nothing. Like it might as well be called unnamed disease unknown because you try to go find a, a support group for undifferentiated connective tissue disease and that's something that you know we've talked about in the show before when we've interviewed people without diagnosis is that can be so much more isolating than any of the other disorders because if you have a name you have a community you've got a whole bunch of people that you can go on like a facebook group or join a facebook group and at like two in the morning you can go 
which I have done, by the way, two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> um, so this is what's happening in my dying or is it Ellers Stainless? This is what's happening in my dying or is it POTS? Is it mast cell activation or am I having an anaphylactic shock? Or am I having an anaphylactic shock? Because <laughs> I'm not at basically, I mean, because like, you know, if you're listening to this, we have a great international audience. We both are in the United States. And I don't know about your insurance, but when I go, it can be like a $3,000 deductible before I even have to start paying the 20% of a $90,000 hospital bill. So we're talking like anytime I go could be a devastating impact on my family's finances. So, you know, it's a very big question for us of do we go? Is it a heart attack? Is it like we have to really ask these questions. You're working and this is in the news right now is um, teachers and school people who have such a small amount of sick days that when someone gets cancer or their child gets very sick, other wonderful people who have more empathy than the system has donate their sick days so that the person can be taking care of what needs to be taken care of. How is that working for you? <laughs> I mean, um, that's a leading so I question, have... I realize, but <laughs> you're working full time. And I know that like this interview is going to take everything out of me. I'm going to be in bed for the rest of the day. Thank you, Riverdale. That's what I'll be watching all day. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I, when I was working in, um, in my twenties and I was as sick as, you know, really sick, it was, it was really hard to try to fake it enough to even sit in a chair or to try to be present for my work day. How, how the hell are you doing this? Um, I have to admit, like, and that's one of the main reasons to, um, I think I find so much solace in rare last year. I mean, I felt, I felt like a horrible daughter, a horrible wife, a horrible social worker. Like I felt like I was failing at everything. Um, and that's a lot of how rare came about was because the, like, just, I, it was a place no one could tell me I was failing or anything. Oh my God, like it, yes. <laughs> like it was, and I didn't have a community. I was like, well, I guess I'll build my own community. <laughs> like, um, and I was like, and I'll be more inclusive, <laughs> but I mean, it's been really, really, really hard. Um, I am fortunate that in the district of Columbia, we have 96 hours of leave on top of our school schedule. So we have very generous leave. Um, okay. I, I just need so to tell you, everyone in New Zealand, in the UK, in, they just jaw drop because <laughs> that is not generous in any other country. Like 96 hours yeah. of extra is not enough time to get your chemotherapy. It's not enough time. To no, spend it's with your not kid. Like all like everyone just jaw dropped except in the United <laughs> States where everyone's like, where do I get this job? <laughs> what, yeah, what, exactly. what, what magic are you speaking of? Like I just need so to be like, super clear because we, we have an audience that spans yeah, every continent except Antarctica. And we you know when we're super excited that there's anything like, people are like, I'm sorry, what you guys don't just get time off when you have cancer to like, and you're a, you're in a school taking care of kids and that's still not something. Yeah. That's still not something here. No, it's not. And, and you know, unfortunately, there's also an unwritten rule. Like, I feel that I have all this time, but it's also, but you're, you don't, you don't take it. You're not like, that's mm. not what you're supposed to, you're not supposed to take it. Like you're, mm. you know what I mean? Like it's somehow reflective of um, like what an employee I am by my, how much leave I take. And that's very much the culture of where I work. Um, work has been awful. Um, I, I have not had the support of my administration. Um, I mean, for the first year, I, I would, I would go into my review, like my evaluation with a stack of medical, because like I was being called um, unreliable. I like, I had no understanding and I didn't look sick and I, it wasn't something I talked about because how do you go up to someone and say, I don't know what I have, but I have something and it's doing all this different stuff to me and it's affecting the way, like, I'm sorry that I can't always be on time to pick up this kid. I'm not like, give me a heads up. I really genuinely forgot that what you said, because I used to never have to write anything down. So that was a huge adjustment for me to have to like, if I wrote a to-do list, it was because I like to cross things off or I, I was bored. Like it was not because of the necessity. I never forgot anything. And so people telling me things in the hallway, like, I can't tell you, my name has been smashed against the mud. It mattered a lot more last year. This year, I'm just like, okay, like, say what you're going to say, do what you're going to do, because, like, until you've walked in my shoes, until you know what it is, it takes, I work four miles, I live four miles, it takes me 40 minutes because of its city traffic, and that alone, that right there alone 
can, I could sleep for half the day based on that commute. Uh, That's one of the things really that they talk about a spoony culture is, and it's really important for other people to understand is just brushing your teeth. That's a spoon. Oh, Taking a shower. Yes. That can be like four spoons. Like you don't understand fatigue until you need a nap after a shower. And then commuting, like sitting in a bus or waiting for a bus and then getting to like all of these things that, you know, when you're in healthy world, you just don't even think about. That do other, it. Yeah. It's just it, the idea behind all this is that everyone has a different starting point. Caretakers, caregivers, they have a different starting point than people who just wake up and do the basics. Like if you're taking care of someone, that's, that's a different start point when you get to work at, you know, whatever time when you're sick, it's a different You've already run a yeah. marathon before you got to work. Like these are important things for people to understand. And there's an issue in the United States right now of needing to understand to have compassion. And that needs to end. Mm-hmm. Like you don't need to understand to be compassionate of someone. Well, and like that's a huge part of what like, like my messaging with rare is, is just Oh, I, I popped my foot out. It's okay. Keep, keep oh, going. Okay. I'm just trying to put my foot back in. I'm just very subtly <laughs> trying to relocate my entire foot. All good. See, like, normal people don't have to worry about relocating their foot in the middle of a podcast interview. You know? Right? So, I've never mean, relocated a shoulder. <laughs> and, you know, and the pain that's associated with that. And, like, <laughs> that I, I start when, like, when I say that I can't stand for more than 20 minutes, like, and it's not respected at work. And I'm put on multiple duties a day where I'm trying to explain to you that when you put me in the room with 300 kids at recess, like you're killing me for my after. Like I, you, I Lord of the flies activity. is what you all just started. Like. <laughs> well, and also I, I feel like it's like rather than utilize me to the best that they can, it's, it's more just refusal to accept that I'm, this is, like what I can give. Um, I am on a intermittent FMLA, which to me means nothing unless the government's going to come and sit and, you know, check my boss every time that he is insensitive or he, he, yeah, he doesn't fire me, but okay. Like I'm punished in every other sense of the term. Mm. And that's what people don't realize either is that like, there's no real protection with FMLA. Like, no. And people think like the ADA is like, this incredible thing that it's important. It was a, it was a first step, but there's no teeth to it. Like I called up to try to like file a complaint because the building I had to go to once a week had the handicapped spot in front of the stairs. There was no ramp. There was just stairs. Like that was there. Like it was insane. And when I called, they're like, really, I could just write something on letterhead, but unless you're willing to sue and spend money on a lawyer, there's nothing mm-hmm. you can really do. Like, we can try to shame them, upset them, but uh, there's really, you have to hire a lawyer. I'm like, great, because yeah. I'm repaying for my own physical therapy since the government refused, or my insurance is like not willing to pay for it, it anymore. Not paying for a lawyer. Yeah, exactly. And like, and mind you, um, when you don't, people don't realize when you're this sick, every, you see everything as a, like, to me, I see everything as like a fight, like a bat, like, do I really just the thought of like hiring a lawyer and going and, and going through what I legally, whatever to me, like, I'm just like, I don't care. Like, yeah. Just let it go. Like, like to me, I'd rather like, there's so many things that, that I don't have the fight to, to fight the fight of like the stairs of the ramp. Like I, I, I don't have it in me. No, seriously. That's a real thing. And that's super important for people to understand or to forgive themselves for is like, there is only so much fight that you have in you because an argument is going to take everything out of you. And I've tried to explain this to my family. It's like, I'll say no two times. After that, I have no fight left. So either you're going to do what you're going to do despite what I've said, or you're going to respect my wishes, but I'm not going to keep doing this. Like we fought for my daughter to go to the school across the street from our house. They sent her to one forty minutes away. And I fought for six months and then I had to stop fighting and just, I found she's now in like an internet school, but like people got mad at me for that. Like you, cause you should have fought to the end. You know, like that yeah. whole like subtext, a good mother would fight to the end. And like the good mother decided to be aware and alert enough to be there for her daughter rather than spend every ounce of energy I had on a fight. I may or may not win. And I think that's such a great point because that's, I feel like a constant battle I have is, fighting for 
like I'm very much so like I need to go with how I feel right now like right now I'm sitting I can do this interview with you like I'm going to try to get as much as I can out of this sitting up cognitively there because what I have some very, very like my, I swear the protein is definitely attacking my brain or something because like I'm just nowhere near the person I used to be but also like I I feel like a lot of times it's just blank. I stutter. I, I have so much. So if I feel cognitively, like, actually alert, like, I usually want to soak up every minute of that. Like, I, and so I can't plan for the tomorrows because I never know what that tomorrow's going to bring. Seriously. At all. And you brought up a really good point. Like, Sophia Vergara, I think, said something to this in Modern Family. I don't watch the show, but I saw this one clip that I loved. And it was this um, – I'm going to break it down because I'm not going to quote it. I will suck at that. But it was the <laughs> idea of, like, she was like, can you imagine how smart I would sound? I sound in Spanish because I am translating everything in my head before it comes out of my mouth in English. So can you imagine if – you know, like, you're making fun of me for, for being slower, for messing my words up, but that doesn't – say anything about my how smart I am and I feel like you know like as I'm doing the word salad right now like I used to be very smart I used to be incredibly <laughs> smart and I lost that person because the inside it makes sense it's that word salad like organizing into words that seems to get lost along the way and it, you know I'm not smart to speak two languages as well but like yeah. just I feel like it's almost a second language to go from my thoughts to the words that or yeah, not coming out properly. I hope that made sense to someone because yeah. it made sense to me because it's exactly kind of what I feel like every single thing is, and and that's just again a very isolating thing. I I do. I mean, God, I had my I've had my boss literally excuse me from me reading my own clinical like findings. Because he's like, you you make us sound dumb, or like, and he's like, just in those words, like, uh, he's like I know, you, I know, and like this year he's a lot of like, I know you've got like that thickness or something, so like, why don't something? you just only read what's on the paper, like, why don't you, or why don't you put things on the paper, like, so I just don't talk now, so and so like, just yet again, just like an isolating factor. I mean, I'm. I'm being very stubborn. I also know that. I know that I'm staying at work because it feels like if I give this up too, like I don't. Work used to be such a huge part of who I am, mm. who I was. And um, I definitely feel like if I give up social work, if I give up this, like then I really like, I I already don't like half the food I, don't, I used to like. So, I, you know, I don't enjoy half the things I used to enjoy and like testing, I hate testing. I hate actually talking like <laughs> to people. Like, how hard was that? Like, I went from being this social worker who would just like owning my own private practice to being like, oh, shit, you want to talk? Like, really? Prefer like not. <laughs> and so, like, that, that's that's a very difficult thing. And you know, it's one of the huge reasons why I'm trying to build rare as much as I can, um, so that I can kind of change into my new life. Uh, so talk to me about rare because I I mean there's so much we could still go on about rare yeah, yeah. everything and I we could I am dislocating like every bonus we're speaking oh, no. and we have like you know you don't have much time left and I really want to get to rare because I I want to also oh god words <laughs> this is where I need my painkillers so bad it's amazing when I get in pain how bad my my English gets um but we were talking in the beginning about, like, the the weird, like, idea that this has to be something. And we've been talking about, like, no, our projects are about, like, making sure there's still a life after this. Like, after I can't do this. Like, I've, I've lily pad jumped from, like, teacher to professor to jeweler to <laughs> can't do that anymore to photographer. Can't do that anymore to illustrator. Can't do that anymore to podcast. Um, and so you, you're setting up your, I call it lily pads, like you're just a little yeah. pad jumping around when the one pad starts sinking, you jump yes. to the next one. And so you're setting up another pad for yourself of rare. Can you, it's like, I went on your website and by the way, anyone who's listening, please head over for show notes. It's at the top, very top of all the show notes is a link to rare. Go check it out. It's an awesome site. There's some really great swag. I will be ordering later. Um, but tell me about this. What, what's the message? What, what are you doing on the website? Like. So, um, like I said, I, I really started it because I know now I, I need to, I'm at the point where I can feel that I need some therapy, but you know, 
for the most part, it's hard when you're a therapist to be like, I'm going to go to therapy, right? Because everything. So, but I knew I needed an outlet. And and so I just started uh, crafting. It was something I could do in my house by myself. Um, I got, I was never a crafter, but I bought everything off Etsy because <laughs> I love small details. So I kind of just like, you know, started learning all these different things and, you know, got, you know, good at it and kept expanding it. And so going to a doctor's appointment, my wife and I were fighting and I, I was 160, I had nothing to wear. And so I, you know, of course upset that, you know, no one can see what I'm feeling or no one can see how much, how hard all these things are. And you just want me to go, go, go to the doctor and be okay with this. And so I ran upstairs and I made myself a sweatshirt and it said, this is rare. Like I thought, period. Like I just thought that this, that for whatever reason, that's how my anger came out that day. And I looked at it and I was like, oh my God, this is, this is rare. This is exactly what, and, um, from that point on, I just started thinking about how I wanted to build this community for myself. If, if no one was going to have like a space for me, um, then I wanted to build one. And so that's what I started to do. And um, all of the pieces are really that kind of, they're all kind of a little, um, they're set to start a conversation. They're to open the door. Um, I really, the whole idea that everyone's fighting a battle that we know nothing about. Uh, you know, the listeners don't know, you know, your, your, your joints are literally falling out. You know, my feet are on fire. Um, and you know what? Maybe the person that's next to you, they're getting a divorce. Like, that's an invisible challenge. And it's so hard. Addiction. So, I mean, addiction is yes, this huge this invisible challenge. Health. I mean, eating disorders, um, sexual assault victims, PTSD. I mean, like the idea, Mm -hmm. I mean, I love the rare message, but there's also a very real fact that it's not that rare. Like everyone next to you is dealing with something you're not seeing. And that's where, like, I just, I loved what you said about compassion in your, in what you had written. And that's one thing, like, I mean, I'm not, I'm not telling anyone who to vote for, and this is actually not a political statement, but Pete Buttigieg, Mayor Pete, talks about this idea of compassion and that we need to get to a point where we don't like look at someone and make a decision about them. And like the idea that you have to understand someone and understand what they're, you, you don't have to understand to just be compassionate and be kind. Yeah. And, and, and you don't have to walk in my shoe to know that some, that my shoes are difficult. And, and that's why I, um, from rare, I branched and I, I started kind of the greater than campaign which is just the idea that you are greater than blank. Mm. Fill it in. Yeah. Fill it in for today. Fill it in for a, a period of time. It doesn't really matter. The idea that like you have, you are greater than your challenge. You are greater than, even if your challenge that day is just that like Ben and Jerry's ran out of like half things. Like that's a, that like some days can just be it. It doesn't always have to be like monumental, but like for you that might have ruined your day a little bit. And I wanted this idea that, like, you don't always, we always don't want to be comparing each other either. Like, cancer is not worse than this, is not worse than this. Mm. Like, I, I often find that if I said I had cancer, that I would get a lot of compassion. Um, you know, when I say I, I'm going through chemo right now, and it's a different chemo than, but if I say, like, yeah, you know, I have chemo today, it's, it's brushed off because it's not like cancer. Like I feel, and that cancer is just fill it in with any other known, like really more upfront. People popular. talked about like car accident. Like I wish I, I wish this pain was from something that I could point to the date of injury. And then everyone goes, Oh, okay. Yeah. I get it. This, yeah. Yeah. How do you explain that you, your life slowly slipped away and I, and I didn't even notice it. Like I literally was, like, I didn't okay, even know it was beautiful happening. sentences I've ever heard. Yes. <laughs> um, and so, you know, my whole message being with rare is about, um, the, like I said, the greater than, um, my hope is that eventually it will continue to grow. And like every month I'll be able to give to a specific, like, so in June, I'm going to give to, um, a youth shelter that does LGBT. So I'm going to, you know, greater than hate is my June campaign. Um, greater than lupus I did in May. Um, April I did sexual assault and, um, I think I did sexual assault and 
maybe IBS. But my the whole point of being that fill it in the blank. It doesn't really matter um, because you're greater than it. And you know what? You don't have to have a label to have a community. And that's kind of what I want Rare to be. Because like you said, this is if we all put a sweatshirt on today, like we would all have something rare to say that's just unique to us. Um, you know, I do, and I donate 15% of the proceeds to National Organization for Rare Disease. So, Rare Disorders, excuse me. So it's a beautiful business plan. And if you want some good swag, that's some really, really good stuff there at the sweatshirt. I'm eyeing very closely. <laughs> so please go visit. Um, it'll be right at the top of, of our list. Is there anything you wanted to cover that we have not talked about? So we're at like 50 no, minutes. I, oh man. It feels so fast it when does. you have someone to talk to. Wow. Like I said, this, this virtual thing is way too cool, but um, I can't thank you enough for, giving me a voice and a platform to this is really the first time I've gotten to share my story in this forum. So I really can't, I appreciate you. As soon as I found your stuff, I listened to what well, that's the other thing. I'm like petrified of sleeping because I never know how I'm going to wake up. So like I'll be up all night just like crafting and be like, you know, I was inspired. Like I have a few new pieces coming out that I made literally listening to your, your podcast. So um, so thank you. Thank you for doing what you do. Thank you for your lily pad, you know, in the world. <laughs> I'm so glad it helps. It, it always surprises me as close as I get to shutting it down because I get, I, I, I've been like absent. I've had this whole thing, the entire Invisible Not Broken has been running on automation for about three weeks. And oh. like, I was so bad for a lot. And like, every time I get close to like shutting it down, I get some email from someone that like is dated at like 2 a.m. Like, <laughs> it's two in the morning. I don't sleep. This is helping. I feel less alone. Yeah. I'm like, okay, and so then, I'm not quitting. All right, got it. <laughs> so, so true. I feel like those messages come exactly when you need them the most. And I do think though that, you know, we have to keep roaring, we have to keep bringing this to the forefront. Um, I don't know how it will change. And, I don't know how I only I only know that if we put all of our students together, maybe maybe we can make this happen because it, no, it's a difficult thing. How you know, like to, we're the only ones that can advocate for it, but how can we advocate when we're we're too tired? That is like one of the ultimate cruxes that I think everyone just went, "Yep, that one." Like I'd love to advocate for myself, and a lot of us are very compassionate and want to advocate for others who even have less of a voice than we do, and it's like. So <laughs> I'd love to help out. I would love to advocate. I cannot even feed myself today. Like, <laughs> uh, no. So like I said, I, I just, I genuinely, I, I'm one of those bingers at 2 a.m. That was like, wait a second. And, I, and then I'm like, just, I'm so oblivious sometimes. I'm like, they have podcasts? Like, I can listen to somebody tell me and I could just be like, yes, yes. So, um, yeah, the funny thing is, is like most of our first time listeners were just diagnosed or just heard about a disorder that matches theirs and they will type in the name of the disorder and whoever we interviewed with that disorder will come up and then it's like, Oh, okay. Now I know what life is like with this. Like now I have a general idea that, you know, like, okay, it's not the end of the world or maybe it is, but like at least there's someone else who's talking about it. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much. My husband and I were just, as I had a major, like, depression freak out because I miss being a photographer and I miss running a business. Oh. I miss having money of my own. Like, I miss, like, yeah. earning money and um, doing my own thing. And he was like, okay, but what you did was important as a photographer. What you're doing now, way more important. Like, you're doing so much more. And it's like, I don't know what i do without this. Like, you, you talking about, like, your your relationship and some of the struggles. I have so much respect for you. Like I, I don't think people realize just how supportive my family is and my husband is and my, my daughter and my son and my mother are like, I hear stories from the rest of like from you and from other people. Let's say that your wife isn't supportive, but like the level of non questioned support I have is psychotic. I could not do half of what I do without like amazing kids, amazing family, friends, like, I'm super lucky with that net, and anyone who's having trouble with that net, I bow down. That is so hard. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I now, I, but it's, you know, it's still so hard like, without that diagnosis, without, like, you know, they're angry, they're upset, they haven't even had a chance to grieve, they still have hope that, I know I'm never going back, because I'm in my body, but yeah. I think that they still have some hope, and 
Yeah. How do you? And then I just sit there and I'm like, how do I crush that hope for them? Like, I don't want to oh be the one God. to crush that hope. And that could be, an, I'm sure, a whole other podcast. But, you know, no, I have like to admit. a great point. Like, whenever someone, like, who you know comes up to you and goes, oh, it looks like you're having a great day. And you're like, that's a compliment, right? Oh, my God. Like, yeah, maybe I'm having a good pain day. But you do understand this is an anomaly, right? You, you get that we're not going this isn't a sign that things are moving forward. This is a sign we get to enjoy right now. Exactly. Um, and, you know, my wife is, she is wonderful with Rare. I spend way too, I mean, I work full time and then I go home and I spend the next 17 hours on Rare. And, and you know, so I'm very, very lucky. I, I, I wish they had a safety net because they they have become such a great safety net when so many people have walked out of my life. You know, my mom, my sister, my stepdad, my dad, and my my wife, but yeah, like it's, they, 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 like I said, they need a safety net because I could never be them. And I, and they always like, I, you could never be you and blah, blah, blah. But cause it is, it's, I just look at them and I'm like, wow, the pain you're going through is so different than me, but it's still so there. Oh my gosh. Yes. And on that note, just, you know, everyone remember, uh, compassion does not require you to have to understand. You can just be <laughs> compassionate. You can just be caring wonderful person uh, a huge thank you to all the caregivers in the world and um, if you want to come on the podcast we have interviewed caregivers in the past no caregiver has emailed me lately and I'm very happy to have caregivers on the episodes to talk about what their lives are like um, so thank you everyone for listening thank you for the kind reviews we've been getting lately I appreciate that um, still nicest thing you can do for the podcast is to head over to Apple Podcasts say nice things give us stars if you have any things that are upsetting or you want to change I do read them I don't necessarily respond I don't have a lot of energy to respond but I promise you I do read everything and I do absolutely consider what you're saying um, so uh, please share this episode I think it's one of our really good ones to share to people I think we covered a lot of great stuff and head over to rare um, if you go to our show notes it's gonna be the first thing you can click on and um, until next week be kind be gentle and be a badass <laughs>